It's good to be with you today. Uh, last Thursday, I preached a message on Noah. And then Friday morning, I got the plague. <laughs> it was bad. I don't know. It wasn't COVID. I don't know what it was, but it was bad. And by Saturday, I was texting Matt and saying, have you ever pinch hit before? Because there was no way I was going to make it. So I appreciate him doing so, but I got a couple of things I got to take up with Matt today. First of all, a few weeks ago, Nathan and I didn't appreciate the comment about all preachers being heavy. And then last week, even though I bought caramel corn to tell him thank you yesterday, um, he said something about him looking better looking than me by making sure you all knew he was filling in. So I didn't hear any complaints, so I guess the liberties he took are okay, but uh, I want to make sure you know that uh, I don't agree with some of those opinions. This is the third week in a series that we've been calling, I Did Not See Him Coming. As we begin to lay the groundwork, as we lead ourselves into Bethlehem in the Christmas season, to really see why all of this unfolded. And today we, we are entering that third series, and we will wrap things up next week as we really enter and kick off the Christmas season. But you know, a couple of weeks ago, we watched evil enter the world. And then we watched the world be infected by that same evil. So God decides to destroy the whole world. And last week, Matt shared with you about Noah and that destruction and every living creature in it, all except for Noah and his family. And unfortunately, what we discover after Noah leaves the ark is what's wrong with the world is not the world. It's the people in it. And when Noah and his family walk off the boat, evil walks off the ark with them, and it continues to infect all of humanity in Genesis 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And everyone who comes after them will find evil, and it will continue to spread. So God finds another man and his family who he will use to change the world and ultimately set in place the final cornerstone for what will be the future of salvation. This man that he finds is 75 years old when he comes to him, and his name is Abram. God tells Abram in Genesis 12 to go and travel to a new place that God will give him without any information as to what this place would be, how he would know when he got there, what it would look like when he arrived, or when he would even get there in the end. Try that with your family. Uh, by the way, uh, honey, we're going to move. Uh, God wants us to move, but I don't know where we're going. I don't know when we'll know we're there. I don't know what it will look like. I don't know what it'll be like, but we're just going to get out put all our stuff in a cart, and we're just going to walk on foot until God says, this is the place. Well, that's what he did in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. <laughs> Abram and his family travel 900 miles going wherever God leads them and travel on foot for 900 miles believing for God's wisdom and discernment and direction. And once he arrives, Abram then says to this 75, or God says to Abram, this 75-year-old man, and by the way, I'm going to give you offspring. <laughs> so first, leave your house, travel 900 miles until I tell you to stop. And when he gets there, he says, and now I'm going to give you offspring at 75 years old. And you know what Abram does? Much like Noah, when it says, and, the Lord, and, and Noah did all the Lord commanded him, Abram builds an altar and sacrifices and worships God. He doesn't question it. He doesn't concern himself with whether God's able. He believes in the miracle to come. God's decided he will use Abram to bring real salvation to mankind. He is going to use Abram and his family to change the trajectory of mankind. You see, Noah built an ark, but Abram built an altar. The solution to saving the world would be in this small, 
inconspicuous man buried in the Chaldean region. And the promise that God makes to him, one that no one else is even aware of. And every time God affirms his promise to Abram, Abram builds an altar and worships God and is obedient and faithful. You're going to see that happen over and over and over again in the story. For it's in the altar and in the sacrifice that Abram makes where the true worship is really occurring. When we talk about worship today, we talked about worship looking like discipleship and singing and the word of God. But it can also be in this sacrifice that Abram is giving. True worship is about sacrifice and submission. Now, almost 10 years later, Abram is now 85 years old. We're into Genesis 13, 14, 15, and still no child. 10 years later, after he walks 900 miles with his family and moves into a place that God had promised him, where he would establish great nations, he promises him an offspring, and for 10 years, 76, 77, 78, there is no child. You ever been there? You swear you heard God say something. You knew for sure that's what he wanted from your life. You thought he made a promise, and there you are 10 years later wondering what's going on, trying to figure out what happened, and maybe you misunderstood God. Then, another 14 years later, when Abram is 99 years old, God comes to Abram and says, I'm changing your name to Abraham. By the way, still no son. I'm changing your name to Abraham. And God tells Abraham, you will be the father of many nations and kings will come from you. And I will establish a covenant between you and me that will be everlasting and will be for your descendants for generations. And what does Abraham do? He builds an altar. He sacrifices and he worships God. He doesn't question. He doesn't concern himself whether God's able. He still doesn't have the offspring. He's done everything God's told him to do. And here he is at 99 years old saying, change my name, walk 900 miles, believe in the promise. And here he is again, building an altar, sacrificing and worshiping God. Then, after 20, I will say, little footnote, uh, Abraham decides at some point that maybe God's will needs a little speeding up. So he does have some indiscretion in here. He has a child with his wife's servant. Uh, that doesn't turn out so well. By the way, that, that child still today has a line of evil that has caused problems for all of mankind. Uh, so sometimes when you get the idea that maybe you'll help speed God's will up because you knew what he meant, don't do it. Abraham found out the hard way. It's a bad idea. But even in that indiscretion, God continues his faithfulness towards Abraham and towards Sarah. And after 25 years of waiting, from the day he left his home and walked 900 miles to the new land that God had promised, Sarah finds out she's pregnant. And you know what her response is? She laughs. As a matter of fact, that's why his name is Isaac. Abraham calls him Isaac. And just as God had promised, there's a child. And again, what does Abraham do? For the fourth time, we find him building an altar giving a sacrifice, and worshiping God. Again, Abraham builds an altar, sacrifices, and worships. Abraham has seen God work all these years of trusting and waiting, and they've all finally paid off. He now is established as the father of many nations. He is now in the land of promise. He is going to be the descendant, the line of the savior of the world, and everything is falling in place what could possibly go wrong? Well, that takes us to Genesis 22, where our story really is today. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1, it's never how you want a story to start when God, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Oh boy. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Whew. I mean, this man heard God say, go 900 miles to the place I will show you where I will establish you as the father of many nations. 
stood for 25 years while he waited for this promise and time after time built an altar, sacrifice, and worshiped. And now God is saying, take the son you love, the one I have promised you, and sacrifice him to me? I can tell you right now that often God's plan doesn't make sense to us. Not at all. But here's what else I can tell you. Isaiah 55 and verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's in these very difficult moments when God asks of us so much that we just can't seem to understand why that we have to know this very tough and short answer, we're not meant to or built to understand some of these things. We cannot see time from its beginning, nor can our minds even fathom or comprehend it. I can barely keep up with my to-do list. I can't imagine having to comprehend all of the wonders of the universe, keep it all running, and make sure everything is going according to plan. But we're not meant to. The short and tough answer is that we're not supposed to understand all of these things that are going on in Abraham. Our minds could not survive the knowledge or the full depth of the plans that move throughout time and the universe as God maintains all of it. But the good news is he does. He knew what was happening the entire time and he was fully in control. And just like when God came to him and said, move, when God came to him and said, I'm going to give you a son, when God came to him and changed his name and made him the father of many nations, the very next morning, Genesis 22 and verse 3, it says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. I'm going to tell you really, really important information you've got to know this morning. Real worship involves true sacrifice and submission. Real worship involves true sacrifice and submission. When we genuinely believe in the God of the universe who controls it all, who created us from the dust, who sent his son to die for us, it requires true sacrifice and true submission, even to the point at which we are able to ask to give up something that is so important to us. I want to stop here for just a moment and take in this scene. I don't want it to be lost what's happening here with Abraham and Isaac. This is an excruciating trip for Abraham. He has been waiting for the fulfillment of the promise of Isaac for 25 years, he's done everything that God's asked of him. Every step of this journey, from the moment God said to him, take Isaac and sacrifice him, to the moment he got up and put his feet on the ground and loaded the donkey and gave his servants orders to follow and took the wood and took the knife and told his son Isaac to come with me on a three-day journey. Every single step of the way, he knew he was going to kill his son and sacrifice him to God. If that is not a hard job to do, I don't know what is. It's painful for Abraham. And as Isaac looks him in the face and says, where is the sacrifice, Dad? Abraham knows what he has to do. I don't want you to get ahead of the story here. Abraham doesn't have the luxury of looking at Genesis chapter 23. He doesn't know what's going to happen here. Only thing Abraham knows is God said sacrifice, and that's what I'm going to do. Every step he takes is one step closer to leaving Isaac on the altar and walking away without him. God is not asking us to sacrifice what we want. He's asking us to sacrifice what we love 
more than anything else in the world. Too often we think about what we have. We look at this pile and then we think about what we need. And then we say, okay, what's left? What can I give God? What won't hurt? What is no big deal? What is something that I won't miss? Then we determine what sacrifice will look like. That's not real sacrifice and submission. Abraham was being asked to sacrifice the most important and most critical part of his life. By the way, you should also know that sacrifice and submission requires that you lay it down. God won't take it away from you. If it's real sacrifice and real submission, you will have to give it up. God will not take it from your hands. You will need to make a conscious decision to hand it over to God, whatever the sacrifice he's asking of you. He could have just taken Isaac, but it would have meant nothing. You see, because God gave them Isaac. God gave you whatever it is that he's asking of you to sacrifice. God needed to know that Abraham would be willing to give up Isaac and walk away believing that God would provide and protect. What's the one thing you fear losing more than anything in the world? What's the one thing that if you lost it, you would rather not go on? For some, it might be your future plans. For some, it's your spouse, your children. But whatever it is, that sacrifice and submission is what God is looking for. For some, it's too great a sacrifice. It's the thing that God is telling Abraham to lay on the altar. I can tell you myself, I have walked to Mount Moriah. And I have even sometimes laid down what it is. But I can tell you too many times I have picked it up and walked away with it because it was too much to ask. And I am sure some of you have had a Mount Moriah moment yourself where God said, just give it to me. Truly sacrifice and be submissive over this thing and let me handle it. And we walk up to the mountain and we are excruciatingly willing to lay it down but we are not willing to leave it there and we pick it back up and we take it with us. But true sacrifice and true submission are worship. Remember, every time Abraham found himself in a position like this with God, he made an altar, he sacrificed, and he worshiped God. Now back to Genesis 22 and verse 9. <coughs> when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. This is serious. Abraham is not joking. He is not playing around. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. This is Mount Moriah. Just so you know, this very spot where Abraham is about to sacrifice his son, this is the same place that David is believed to have written many of the Psalms that he wrote. This is where the first temple was built. And while scholars disagree about whether this was Jesus was crucified, it is certainly in the shadows of where Jesus would be crucified. This is the place called the Lord will provide because God will always provide. Let me let you in a little secret. Don't tell anybody else. The ram was in the bush the whole time. The ram was always in the bush. From the day he said to Abraham, take your son and sacrifice him, the ram was sitting there. God had always provided salvation and a way. All he wanted to know was that Abraham was truly willing to provide real sacrifice and real submission. He never intended for Isaac to be slain. He never intended for Abraham to truly kill his son. He wanted to know that Abraham was willing. And by the way, let me let you in another secret. Abraham did not know the ram was there. You see, God always knows the ram is there, but we don't. That's why it's real sacrifice. 
If I know the ram is there, if I know that I have an out, it's not real sacrifice, it's not real submission. But I know that God will always provide. Even in the toughest moments, even in the hardest times, even when things I love the most are on the line, we have to believe in God's provision, especially when it's the hardest thing we will ever do. Abraham did not have the luxury of knowing how this story ended. You have to know that when he walked up to Mount Moriah, he genuinely believed he was walking away without Isaac. He was going to have to live with the idea that he had sacrificed him, but knowing he had done so in obedience to God. You know what's so sad to me? Is that God has asked so much less of me sometimes, and I have been unwilling to walk up to the mountain and lay it down. He's asking you to believe in his provision, trust in his promise, and let him show you again and again how he will always provide. I don't know about you, but I serve a God who provides. I serve a God who has provided for me my whole life. I serve a God who Jeremiah said, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. I have plans to give you a hope and a future. I serve a God who this church saw on Wednesday night. We came and we fasted and we prayed because we believe that God provides. I serve in a church where your leadership and your elders, two weeks ago on a Tuesday morning, marched around this church for an hour, praying and reading scripture and singing to God because we believe he provides. When there's true sacrifice and real submission, That's what God's challenging you today to do, though. Some of you have not even walked to the mountain. Some of you have gotten all the way to the altar and maybe even laid it down, but then you just picked it up and you walked away with it. And God's challenge to you today is just like I used Abraham to provide salvation for the world. I am asking you today to truly sacrifice and submit what it is the area of your life that I have been calling you to do, I'm telling you today is the day to get serious if you genuinely believe that God provides. If you don't, I can understand why you wouldn't want to lay it down. I can understand why it's scary. But if you genuinely believe that the ram will be in the bush, you can believe that God will provide. You don't know how, you don't know why, you don't know when, but you know he will provide. Now, I'm not going to go much farther in this story because truly the point of this is the sacrifice and the submission because of belief in a God who provides. But in the end, I want to just wrap it up here in verse 15. It says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now I don't want to step on her thunder, but Rachel's going to share with you just what this means for us when it says your offspring and all nations on earth will be blessed What God's going to do because of Abraham's faithfulness here will change the course of eternity because God honors Abraham's faithfulness and obedience. And what this means to us as we make one step closer to Bethlehem, what God is doing here in this verse, you don't want to miss it because what Abraham did on Mount Moriah will change the course of humankind. It is extremely important that you understand what happens with Abraham here. My challenge for you today is this. Have you had a Mount Moriah moment? Have you genuinely stood before a God of all creation who says he created you out of the dust of the earth and that a palm of his hand that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that he knows every hair on your head? If you believe in a God like that, have you had a Mount Moriah moment 
where God has said, this is the sacrifice, this is the submission, and you have walked to the mountain, and you have laid it down, and you have sacrificed it to God without any understanding of what might happen, but believing and trusting in him 100%. Because if you haven't today, I want to invite you to have that moment. Would you stand to your feet? I want to just pray for you before the song comes. Today, I am challenging you to think about that Mount Moriah moment. I am challenging you to wonder, have you done with God the business that needs to be done? Do you believe that true sacrifice and submission is an honorable thing to do for God? And if so, know that he will provide. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for your sovereignty. We thank you for what you mean to us. And God, we thank you for the provision. God, we thank you that no matter what, you are always providing. God, I can't even imagine how scary it was for Abraham on the mountain that day. I can't imagine the fear and his hand trembling as the promise you had provided for him was something you asked for him to sacrifice. But God, today there are people in this congregation who are ready to make that sacrifice. They're ready to make that moment, that movement, God, that you've been putting on their heart and their mind for weeks, months, years. They've been struggling with to sacrifice to you, to lay it at this altar right here at the front of these steps, that today you would challenge them to come, to lay it down and say, God, I truly give it to you today and I'm not leaving here with it anymore and I'm believing in a God who provides. God, I pray that you would challenge the hearts and the minds of all here today who would say, Lord, here it is. I give it to you, I'm done. Thank you so much for your provision and for your ultimate provision of salvation through your son, your only son, Jesus. For it's in your name we pray, amen. If you wanna do business with God today, the altars are open.